Hello, I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to our Health Matters webinar, Covering Coronavirus, Fighting the Infodemic. As we meet today, polls show a greater willingness by Americans to get a vaccine, but enormous mistrust still exists with half of all Blacks and about one third of Hispanics saying they don't feel comfortable with the vaccine safety and effectiveness according to the latest Kaiser Family Foundation poll. Meanwhile, sizable numbers of Republicans and about a third of people in rural communities and a third of essential workers say they definitely do not plan to get a vaccine. One reason for the skepticism is, is what's being called an infodemic of misinformation that has interfered with public health best practices at every stage of the pandemic. Those lies and half-truths can proliferate faster than the virus itself with social media as a major culprit. In this webinar, we'll explore how factors including deliberate disinformation campaigns, government messaging, sloppy reporting, and a rush to publish preliminary studies all contributed to a tsunami of misinformation that continues to hinder the fight against COVID-19. You'll hear strategies to report on the infodemic in your communities and learn about efforts underway to combat it, especially in hard hit communities of color where some members of black and brown communities feel what one scholar called vaccine deliberation. Here to help us explore this urgent topic and provide ideas for reporting on these central issues for your audiences and communities, we have three distinguished experts. Carl Bergstrom is a professor of biology at the University of Washington he uses mathematical models and computer simulations to study a wide range of issues. His research is unified by the concept of information. In recent years, his work has looked at the spread of disinformation on social networks and what we can do about it. He co-authored the book, Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World with Kevin West. Dr. Melissa Clark is an emergency medicine physician and leader in population health for Fortune 500 companies, academia, and hospitals. She's been a leading voice in the COVID-19 pandemic on issues of health equity. Frustrated by the onslaught of misinformation and confusion surrounding COVID-19, Dr. Clark has sought to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, especially among African-Americans. She's a co-founder of the group Black Coalition Against COVID-19 and is a member of the DC Health Scientific Advisory Committee, an expert group advising the vaccine distri distribution effort in the District of Columbia. She's a CNN medical contributor and the host and creator of Excuse Me Doctor, a live weekly forum streamed on YouTube and Facebook where she provides a weekly debunk. We'll also hear from Ray Ellen Bichel, a Colorado correspondent for Kaiser Health News. Previously, she was a radio reporter covering the region for the Mountain West News Bureau and KUNC, a public radio affiliate. Ray Ellen was also a data fellow with our Center for Health Journalism, and she recently published an in-depth exploration of what childhood vaccine rates can and can't teach us about COVID vaccine hesitancy as part of her partnership with us and her ongoing exploration of these topics. We wanna thank the Commonwealth Fund, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, and the California Endowment for supporting this program. We also want to thank, express our appreciation for donations to support this programming from individual participants like you. You can tweet about this webinar at the hashtag covering coronavirus. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our panelists first and then we'll turn it over to you, our audience, for questions. Because we have many people participating in this webinar, we'll ask you to write your questions into the Q&A panel of Zoom. You can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems as well. We'll be archiving this webinar later at centerforhealthjournalism.org. We'll start out by hearing from Professor Bergstrom. Professor, in your view, what are some of the ingredients that have made for such a combustible brew of misinformation during the pandemic? That's a, that's a great question and thank you. Um, I'm gonna start off by uh, addressing that. Let me, switch, um, let me switch to the slides here and then we can get started. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'll take you through that very quickly. Um, so let's see, here we are. So uh, I, we've, I've worked on respiratory viruses for a long time and we've been worried about something like this happening. We've known it was only a matter of time and in 2020, our luck finally ran out. The COVID pandemic obviously upended all of our lives and we've all had to become epidemiologists because we've had to understand what's happening in order to plan, in order to keep ourselves and our families safe, uh, in order to understand the world that we live in now. 
And we've relied on the media to help us understand what it is that was happening to us. The problem is, is we began with this enormous scientific uncertainty about a virus that had never been in humans at all before December 2019. And that created this uncertainty vacuum where we didn't have a, you know, we don't have scientific answers to anything. What's the infection fatality rate? Uh, uh, how fast does it spread? Is it, is it airborne? Can you transmit it before you have symptoms? When it started, we didn't know any of those answers. And so it created this enormous uncertainty vacuum that uh, reporters and journalists and, and, and everybody had to, had to deal with, including scientists. Um, and into that uncertainty vacuum came flowing a whole bunch of things. We had organized disinformation campaigns like uh, the ones that were uh, presented early on in you know last uh, you know a year ago February with um, rumors about uh, about you know sulfur dioxide blooms over over Wuhan indicating that hundreds of thousands of bodies were being cremated and things like that. We had disingenuous government messaging, um, you know, like Trump and Kudlow saying, "Oh, this is you know February 26th a year ago. Um, this was all going to go away. We've got it contained, etc." Um, we've had all of these fake studies and astroturfing. So uh, examples of you know, well-organized, well-polished you know, um, uh, studies that are put online, uh, trying to make it look like this is one that's saying that, uh, that hydrochloroquine, um, you know, claiming that hydrochloroquine was, was extremely effective and had been covered up by the medical establishment. We had a change in the, in the culture of how we communicated among scientists. Everyone wanted to work very rapidly. We didn't have time to go through the usual peer review system before sharing results with, with one another in, in the sciences. Um, and so we started to rely very heavily on preprints that hadn't been peer reviewed. Unfortunately, some of them were absolutely dreadful. This one uh, um, uh, claimed that the HIV genome had been inserted into the uh, into, or parts of the HIV genome had been inserted into the coronavirus, and this was indicated indicated that this was a manufactured bioweapon. It was completely false. It was taken down uh, after two days, but in the two days that it was up, um, it became one of the most ever uh, covered articles in the history of the altmetrics uh, sort of you know article coverage um, system. Um, we've seen equally dreadful peer-reviewed work. At left, we've got a paper where. Uh, where people are actually claiming that 5G, you know, proposing a mechanism, a completely non nonsensical mechanism for how 5G could create viruses within your body. Um, at right, we have a, a paper in the Lancet that uh, that uh, turned out to be uh, fraudulent, that um, led to the cancellation of a large number of chlor hydrochloroquine trials. So we've had, you know. Oh, that problem. We've had organized agnotogenesis, and agnotogenesis is the strategy of deliberately creating uncertainty or doubt around a topic. It's the same strategy we've seen from big tobacco, from big oil. Um, now we've seen it from up, you know, those opposed to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, so we've got people trying to raise enough doubt about the science, uh, not necessarily to change people's minds entirely, but to stave off regulation, right? Um, We've had sloppy reporting. Um, this was this was an example where uh, ABC News got a got a story backwards. We've had uh, headlines that contradict their own stories. This one is from this morning. Um, uh, they're talking about how the, uh, the headline suggests that uh, that this new lab study um, thinks that the indicates the, the virus will be far less effective. That's not at all what it says. Um, it doesn't even test the efficacy of the of the virus. Um, we see we have got people that are treating you know crisis the crisis as a career opportunity and pushing themselves uh, to the forefront as sort of pundits and talkers. We get cherry picking of different anecdotes and studies by um, you know if you're by the you know anti mask side will cherry pick their studies uh, you know the the pro mask side may cherry pick their studies and so on. Um, and all of this is all wrapped up in the authority of numbers, which are particularly difficult for us to challenge because they seem to come straight from nature. Numbers seem to have this almost divine authority. They're facts that, you know, not opinions, right? Um, and that's not really right uh, because, of course, the numbers that people choose the way they present them have, can have an enormous influence on the story. The thing is, few of us have the training to see through that kind of quantitative misinformation. That's my, you know, Quick answer to the question. Um, I'm going to take the sort of second half of my time and just make a small number of brief suggestions about how journalists can save us. Um, first of all, is this uncertainty issue? I accept that there is a, a lot of uncertainty. Acknowledge this uncertainty in what you write. 
and recognize that you know early on in a pandemic, if somebody is uh, giving you a certain answer, um, that person uh, is probably not speaking uh, the you know, for the for the scientific community uh, fully. So you know, I talked to one reporter at a top uh, at a at a top outlet who was very concerned that the CDC wouldn't pin down the um, infection fatality rate any any more than between half a percent and five percent and uh you know that was a year ago february and uh the reason they wouldn't do that of course was because we just absolutely didn't know at the same time we had people who were willing to say that it was uh you know a point oh three percent less bad than the flu and we had people that are willing to say it was it was eight percent a catastrophe um but the reality was there was a ton of uncertainty there. And uh, while certainty makes for better headlines, it, it, it doesn't accurately reflect the situation. Don't be intimidated by numbers. Don't use numbers to intimidate people. This is one of the main things I've been working on for the last few years is, is talking about how we can develop an understanding of quantitative information without having a professional background in statistics or in the sciences or anything like that, just by thinking clearly about num what numbers are and what, what numbers mean and so forth. And then sim similarly, as we present information in quantitative form, don't, tr don't kind of use that as a cudgel against, uh, against an audience that may feel intimidated by those numbers. Beware of the information landscape that we're in. Beware of the uh, issues that I talked about at the start, all of the sources of disinformation and misinformation that can come flooding into uh, it, into the information uh, environment around us. Uh, and uh, you don't drop your journalistic standards right at the same time. So, you know, we switched to a preprint system uh, on the fly in science and People would have had a lot more care about reporting preprints. Uh, they would have, you know, not necessarily wanted to be writing stories about preprints. Now all of the stories are about preprints, and this is this is really tricky because um, you know it feels like oh I'm gonna I've got to cover these because this is where all the science is, but but it's forcing me to drop my standards. What do I do? And I think the thing to do is to recognize yes, you know, there were reasons that we were not covering preprints a lot beforehand. Uh, those reasons, you know, some of those reasons still exist. Let's adapt to our coverage of preprints to the fact that this is now where the discourse is taking place. So, um, oops, so, uh, so, you know, weigh each study in the context of the, of the entire literature. So um, yeah, when you write about the latest uh, result about, you know, possible efficacy of a vaccine against a escape variant or something like that, you know, each study does not hold up a new fact that eradicates everything that was written before it. Um, each study is in the you know, very memorable phrase of my colleague, Natalie Dean, um, a pebble on the scale of one hypothesis or another. And I'd like to see uh, much, that explained much more clearly to the public who sometimes feels like they're getting whiplash, sort of just like the you know red wine, is it good for you, is it bad for you? Uh, they feel the same kind of COVID whiplash. Oh, I don't trust any scientists because last week they said these escape variants were bad. Now they say it's no big deal. They don't know what they're talking about. And if this was presented as a pebble on the scale, that would leave people in a very different uh, frame in terms of how they think about uh, what it is that we do as scientists. Of course, we treat each uh, paper as it comes in as, as that pebble on the scale. Um, and, uh, and finally, get outside opinions. And this, is, this helps you know, do things like, cover, you know, I, like covering the preprints. I don't think it is useful to write a paper uh, write a report about a scientific paper or a scientific result where you only speak to the authors. You know, any you know any reasonable study would talk to other people researching in the field who are on any reasonable report would talk to other people researching in the field who were unconnected with the with the original study itself. So, with respect to the quantitative stuff, I've written this book about uh, about how we can think clearly about quantitative information and how it is used to mislead in the information landscape I'm talking about, and. Uh, with that, I will uh, I'll finish up, and that's my sort of you know quick stage setting, if you will, for uh, what we're going to hear from two amazing panelists to follow. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bergstrom. This is so helpful, and I'll just remind everybody that one really great way to find some of those um, other sources who have done work uh, on the same topic but who are not study authors can be by simply going into PubMed, which is a repository of pretty much all medical studies and you can search under topics and it's just really easy and get email addresses for people and so on. Dr. Clark, let's turn to you now. You're co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID-19. 
as you give talks to groups as varied as Washington DC residents and sanitation workers, what are the common threads of doubt you hear in the black community? And as someone devoted to prevention, how might you explain to our audience the forces at play behind vaccine hesitancy or even vaccine deliberation from responses to systemic racism in the medical system to mistrust or of misinformation? Well, uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, for that great question. And thanks uh, to the center for having me today. I am going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And uh, can everyone see that? That's perfect. Thank you. Great. So I think in order to answer that question, we just have to level set around, you know, the understanding that, of course, people of color are getting COVID and dying from COVID two to three times more than whites. And I have to say, in the work that I do in population health, it's very data driven. And so about a year ago, actually last February, um, I was poring over the data as it was coming out from China and seeing that the people who were at highest risk were not just people who were um, elderly, as we were hearing in the press conferences from the administration at that time, but people who had pre existing and chronic conditions. And so immediately, those of us in the field recognized that populations that have health disparities and have higher uh, incidences of these particular diseases like obesity and diabetes and heart disease, kidney disease and lung disease, were going to be disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And unfortunately, that has definitely been what has panned out. But one of the reasons that I, uh, and I love the, the work that the APM Research Lab has done because they quantify this in their project, The Color of COVID, and they give these racial breakdowns as far as we know from states that collect this data. And one of the things that I think sometimes gets overlooked is just the massive numbers of whites who have died from COVID-19. It's over 300,000 now. And I think that sometimes gets lost when we talk about the disproportionate effects of, on people of color. And one reason why I think it's important is because you kind of sometimes encounter bubbles of people who really don't think that COVID affects them. Um, but the raw numbers really are staggering when you look at them. And then, you know, we have to delve into why people of color are dying disproportionately from COVID-19. And of course, in the middle of this diagram, I have the effects of systemic racism, which of course did not start with housing discrimination in the 1940s, but definitely got jet rocket fuel from the policies that were being enacted in the 1940s that allowed for neighborhood segregation by color uh, and by race, and therefore allowed for um, deprivation of resources to those communities that were, that were African-American predominantly, um, and also for um, enhanced exposure to environmental toxins, poor water quality, et cetera, which set up the trajectory for where we are now what, and, and provides the explanations for why COVID-19 has predominantly pro played, uh, plagued um, African-American and, and other um, communities of color. And so starting with economic disparities, as you know, 80% of black and brown people do not have the luxury of a job where they can work from home. So especially early on in the pandemic, um, uh, they were basically sent out like lambs to the slaughter, so to speak, to interact with the public as our sanitation workers, our bus drivers, our grocery, grocery clerks, et cetera, and interact with the public without masks on until the, the clarity emerged around the need to mask. And then of course, living in smaller housing spaces where there's less square footage per person who lives there makes it really difficult to effectively distance. And oftentimes, of course, if they're multi-generational households, people who've gone out to work who then now come home and then spread it to the more vulnerable populations or, or family members who they live with. And then when we think about health care delivery disparities, that's different than health disparities, which are the diseases, the, the effects of all the policies over time, such that people from communities of color have 
those disproportionately higher levels of chronic disease. The healthcare disparity speaks to how do people access the healthcare system? There are fewer doctors and hospitals and specialists in communities of color. There are fewer people have um, insurance. Um, and then even those who have public insurance, a lot of times providers discriminate by not accepting Medicaid, for example. And then when it came to COVID-19, we were told, well, call your doctor to get a COVID test. Well, the very uh, populations that were disproportionately exposed disproportionately did not have access to a doctor to call a, to get a COVID test. Um, so those are just examples of health care delivery disparities. And we're seeing it now in the vaccine distribution rollout, which I'll talk in, about in a little bit. And then finally, uh, disempowerment and mistrust. I think you know, all these factors that I've mentioned thus far breed a lack of distrust in a government which historically has not valued all of its citizens equally, especially those who are African American. And the pandemic was accelerating around the same time of Breonna Taylor's murder, Ahmaud Arbery's murder, and George Floyd's murder. And um, those events fueled the mistrust further by increasing that sense of lack of control that everybody in general was going through because of the pandemic. Um, and that disempowerment breeds mistrust because you feel if no one at the federal level values you or that you're not represented at the table, therefore you're not gonna trust anything that they say or do. So then when the federal government comes out and says, um, you know, or re routinely signals that they're not equally valuing the lives of all communities as we saw throughout the last four years. Um, and then on top of that, giving conflicting advice about the importance of masking and all the things that Carl just covered, calling into question the integrity of government agencies that are supposed to protect our health, touting Operation Warp Speed, um, you know, which implies that there's not really a concern about public safety. It's easy really then to see um, why there's distrust among communities of color. And then when it comes now to vaccine deliberation, the decision about whether to take a vaccine, you also have to throw in those other things that are specific to the African-American community, um, such as history of medical abuses. So if you're trying to say, trust us, you have to have earned that trust. And unfortunately, we don't have a history in this country of earning the trust of the African-American community because of incidences like withholding treatment for syphilis from African-American men in order just to study the natural evolution of the disease. And I submit that, you know, it's actually not even necessarily those historical issues, but it's actually the contemporary microaggressions that happen within the healthcare system. When people of color try to access care these are headlines from the New York Times, but they're based on articles in the medical literature that demonstrate that there's fewer referrals for African-Americans for life-saving treatments, such as heart catheterizations for heart disease or um, kidney dialysis for people with renal failure, or even simply just treating pain. Um, that is, happens unequally for um, African-Americans and for Latinos very well documented in the medical literature. And then finally, the unopposed social media um, that has been going on for the past five years around getting people to doubt the flu vaccine that just got repurposed for getting people to doubt the COVID-19 vaccines that have come out. And so when you introduce that targeted social media into communities like African-Americans who have natural mistrust, where the, the, the ground is fertile to receive that misinformation, those weeds take root and grow like wildfire fire. if there is no opposition, if there's no one coming around and uprooting the weeds and, and putting down weed killer. And so that's what happens. We've seen, you know, the best disinformation has grains of truth in it. Like, oh, this is just like the Tuskegee study. Well, it's not, but enough people know that there was something wrong that happened in Tuskegee that it makes them be hyper alert about this. It's hugely different than Tuskegee because this is a worldwide pandemic, number one. And number two, Tuskegee was about withholding treatment. This is really about advancing, uh, you know, uh, providing treatment for uh, 
a, a health wide concern, a worldwide concern, or that it makes you sterile or alters your DNA. Well, the, the vaccines have genetic material in it. So yeah, that seems like it might make sense on the face of it, but it doesn't because our bodies are exposed to viral DNA all the time. Anytime we get a cold, uh, we get exposed to viral DNA and viral RNA. And so that does not alter our genome. And number two, um, the, the genetic material that gets introduced into our bodies via the vaccine gets destroyed immediately within minutes. So again, doesn't have an opportunity to interact with our DNA. And then, you know, the Kaiser Family Foundation has done great work. And I just wanted to highlight the most recent poll um, in, in January showed that the re refusal rate of African-Americans for the vaccine down there at the bottom in the green was just around the same as the rest of the population. And African-American enthusiasm for taking the vaccine actually jumped by 15 percentage points. And then there were about 43% of people who said, look, we just wanna wait and see. And you know, what is that about? Um, I submit that number one, the, the polls show that if you don't know somebody who had already been vaccinated, you were less likely to get vaccinated. And at the time, only 3% of African-Americans knew somebody, which was half that of the, the majority population. A lot of times because of those healthcare disparities I mentioned, African-Americans don't have somebody to who they, the, a relationship with a provider that they can go to to get their questions answered. And so in that information gap, um, they're more than likely going to turn to somebody who they do trust who might be heavily influenced by social media and therefore they get misinformation spreading. Um, also the polls don't disaggregate by ethnicity. So what might be true for a lever that might convince somebody who's an Ethiopian immigrant or somebody who is um, a Nigerian immigrant might not necessarily be the lever for somebody who is a non-immigrant of, of African-American descent. And so for example, um, we know that for the Ethiopian community here in DC due to research done, which is where I live, sorry, uh, which was done by the Department of Health here, that a lot of times Ethiopians in this community are concerned about the monetization of healthcare and that the vaccines are just another way for the healthcare system to make money, but they're not against vaccinations in, in principle. Something like Tuskegee doesn't concern them. So by disaggregating communities and understanding exactly what is their concern, it makes it more easier to address whatever their issues are. And my biggest concern over the vaccine hesitancy narrative around African-Americans is that it's being used to make policy. So we see in, for example, a place like Maryland where the Republican governor has said, oh, minorities don't want to take the vaccine and that's why they have lower vaccination rates where at the same time, the most populous county with African-Americans have 122,000 people signed up waiting to get the vaccine. It doesn't really reflect what's happening on the ground. And so the work that I've done with the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, for example, we have done national town halls. Um, actually, let me back up. We, we actually are a group of multidisciplinary folks from sort of across society that have come together to do hyper-local messaging. So really looking at disaggregating Af the African-American community into sub-communities and then working with trusted messengers from those communities in order to get evidence-based information out about COVID-19 and about the vaccines. So we've had a range of activities and specifically around the national town halls that we've done, which get about a reach of about 240,000 people per, per event. We've had six of those. We've done internal polling during the event and it showed that from the time we started, which was around October to now, vaccine concerns around, among African-Americans have dropped from 60% down to 30%, which is really kind of just right around par with the general population. Um, uh, also involved uh, in the work that I mentioned around polling communities in DC, we have a DC clinical champions program where volunteers from the physician community have stepped up and are working with the Department of Health to go around to different community organizations and talk to people one-on-one -on -one or community on one 
um, through webinars, et cetera, and sometimes in person about their concerns about the vaccine and specifically um, uh, you know, address their concerns. I've been helping to train those physicians about how to speak to diverse audiences in a culturally competent way. And then finally, almost since the beginning of the pandemic, as I mentioned, when I saw that data, I started doing a streaming show called Excuse Me Doctor, where we really, we do a weekly debunk, we have a theme for the show, we do a recap, but really that debunk takes whatever misinformation is sort of hottest and circulating that week and kind of just dismantles it. So I'll stop there and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. This is excellent and it's given us so much food for thought. We're gonna turn now to our final speaker and then we'll open it up to everyone's questions. Ray Allen, what have you learned from reporting on vaccine hesitancy that you can share with our audience? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me and for the question. Um, I also uh, really appreciate being introduced as a distinguished expert, but uh, I wanna debunk that <laughs> because uh, I'm just a journalist. Uh, the nice thing about that is I get to talk to a lot of distinguished experts. Um, and so I'm hoping to pass along a little bit of what I've learned um, in reporting on vaccination and vaccine opinions over the last year or so. Um, and uh, as other speakers have said, um, happy to take questions afterwards. I think there's sort of three main themes that have emerged a lot when covering vaccine hesitancy. And I hope these might help be guiding forces for other reporters um, as they develop story ideas or reporting. The first is that vaccine hesitancy is not all the same. You'll hear this time and time again, it's not monolithic. The second is that it can be really valuable to zoom into the local level. And the third is that the backstory of why people are making decisions or why people are accessing or not accessing a vaccine um, is really important. So I'll try to break each one of those down a little bit. Um, that first one, that vaccine hesitancy is not monolithic. Um, one quote that really stood out to me when I spoke with a um, researcher in Colorado who's done a lot of work around vaccine hesitancy here is that uh, the decisions are so complex. You can have one family that will, and this is even before the pandemic. So remove the global pandemic as the backdrop, basic childhood immunizations that are required for school. You can have one family that will say, you know, we're going to get these vaccines for this kid and different ones for that kid, or we're gonna fully immunize this child and not that child. Um, so even without the global pandemic and within the same family, these are the same parents, uh, they can make different decisions based on their um, individual risk assessment at a specific point in time. Um, there's also the question of uh, whether uh, vaccine hesitancy towards something like the MMR vaccine in kids that protects against measles, mumps, and rubella is instructive or might contain hints about um, vaccine hesitancy or, or groups that might be vaccine hesitant uh, in the general public towards getting a, a COVID-19 vaccine. Recently did a story about this and I learned really a lot. Um, the answer was, these are probably really different um, decisions that people are making when they're approaching a routine childhood immunization versus uh, vaccine during a, a pandemic and new vaccines during a pandemic. Um, so what I was really hoping to know, you know, we have this wealth of um, national polls that are in some cases updating month by month, um, which are super useful, but they're all on a national level. Um, and they don't tell you, uh, they don't, they don't tell you what might be happening on a local scale, whether that's um, county or city or town. Um, I was really hoping in doing this story that, uh, oh, we, can, we do have this wealth of local data on MMR vaccination um, for many states. And maybe, uh, maybe in states like Colorado, where you can get an exemption to those for any reason, um, that might help us get a sense of where the communities that might end up being um, really vulnerable to COVID outbreaks because they um, are choosing not to get the, the COVID vaccine. Well, it turns out, um, they're again complex decisions so you know the childhood immunization rates they'll capture what parents are choosing to do parents that's a specific age group and um, that might not be reflective of the whole population um there's also uh access is much less of an issue to childhood immunizations whereas access has been a constant theme with uh, um, the covid vaccine and who can get it 
And then um, the issue of, uh, of that, that those are measuring actual refusal rather than um, people's evolving questions or ideas uh, about something for which lots of new information is coming out. So um, that was one of the, the other interesting things that stood out um, in that question about childhood immunizations versus the COVID-19 vaccine is um, that uh, if you look uh, in some states that have 10 years of data, you can look at 2009 and 2019 at individual schools and those rates hold pretty steady. Like if, if a school had herd immunity against measles 10 years ago, it probably will still have herd immunity against measles now and vice versa. So those are, those are pretty steady versus as Dr. Clark mentioned, um, we're seeing uh, opinions shift and change uh, on, a, on a month to month basis with all of these polls. People are, um, are changing their minds and, and especially so um, on political lines. So a really interesting tidbit that I learned recently is that uh, while, while childhood immunizations are largely, um, uh, you can think about it as bipartisan or apolitical, they cut across uh, people who refuse vaccines for their kids, they fall, you'll find them everywhere. You'll find them in a rural, private, religious school. You'll find them in a um, big public high school in a city, you know, it just kind of cuts across all those lines. But one thing that um, researchers I spoke to were very concerned about and are trying to follow very closely is this uh, increasing politicization of the COVID vaccine. And what you're seeing in these polls is that um, there's a, a divergence in uh, in opinions on the uh, uh, in trust in the vaccine uh, based on your party affiliation, and people are pretty worried about that that I spoke with um, because uh, there's the sense that once something moves from uh, the realm of opinion into the realm of political identity it becomes um, much less movable. You become much less persuadable. Um, as Saad Omer at Yale said, uh, even in the face of a lot of evidence, you're, you're, you're less persuadable if, if uh, something has become part of your identity. And there's concern that um, depending on how things go in the next few months, that might, uh, that might affect people's opinions uh, about other vaccines, not just the COVID-19 one. Um, second point, uh, it's so valuable to zoom in to the local level. Um, the reason I say this, predates the uh, COVID pandemic. I got to follow around some researchers back in uh, like a year ago um, that were going around to rural counties in Western Colorado. Um, they wanted to know why people weren't getting uh, vaccinated with the HPV vaccine. And what they knew from preliminary research is that uh, it varies a lot depending on the specific community that you're in. So what they were doing is gathering um, uh, workshops full of citizens, just people who lived in, in some of these communities to talk through like, what, why, what are the reasons in your specific community that people might not be wanting to get this vaccine? Is it a church leader? Is it access? Is it something else? Is it that advertising should be happening at the YMCA instead of at XYZ clinic? Um, and, and they were trying to tailor local solutions locally to specific communities. Um, I, I think that that same um, thread that like local matters uh, holds with the COVID-19 vaccine, at least from what I'm reading and from, I'm, from, I'm, from what I'm hearing. Um, the other uh, thing that I want to say about the importance of zooming into the local level, I think, is uh, that I keep drawing on these national polls because that's really valuable information, but um, they... I think they do kind of obscure, and, and Dr. Clark went into this a bit, I think they can obscure a lot of really interesting, important um, stories on a more granular scale. And there's a couple things that come to mind as examples. One is a story I read recently about uh, young people in the military. So this was like, what do they think about the COVID vaccines? And um, one of the quotes that really stood out to me was this person who was saying, Basically, uh, you know, we don't have we don't have a choice to do uh, what we want with our hair or our behavior or our clothes. And finally, I was given a choice, so I said no. Um, that is really interesting because that's such a specific population with um, specific uh, rules. And and maybe uh, looking at these polls um, uh, would obscure 
that fact. You might not, uh, they might not capture that like in a certain community, just having a choice is a very uh, compelling thing for some people. Another really interesting conversation here is um, I talked to a minister in uh, rural New Mexico and um, it's a frontier community. So uh, that means really rural, like tiny town, but also tiny town very far from other towns. And what he said is, you know, there's um, that it seems like messaging has been um, focused around uh, people of different races, ethnicities, and age groups, but that didn't really hit home with his population. His population was a lot of different races and ethnicities and age groups, um, but they are what what they were dealing with in their daily lives. Uh, and the way to approach them about the COVID vaccine and engage them with the COVID vaccine might be really different. Um, and he, he gave the example of, um, you know, appealing to, uh, or just thinking about uh, places where a lot of uh, communities where uh, they've lost more people to suicide over the course of the pandemic than they have to COVID-19. That's a totally different landscape. Uh, a place where people, um, where a message might be more effective if it's told, if it's framed as rather than protect yourself, you can protect your family better by protecting yourself. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity to go um, really, uh, really specific and, and talk to people in some of these areas that might um, cut across some of these uh, vast categories that we see represented so much. I'm running out of time, so I'll try to keep this real short on the third point, but um, important to look at the backstory. Um, the, you know, the example of Tuskegee coming up all the time. Um, one thing that I thought was really fascinating in, in a couple of conversations with researchers who are thinking about this a lot is that um, that's kind of shorthand and it's, it's a little bit lazy to constantly be referring to Tuskegee. Um, it puts the, the onus on the under vaccinated population and it focuses too much on the choices that people are making today. Um, and uh, sort of fails to look at what are all the different reasons that might be um, leading up to someone um, either choosing to get a vaccine or being able to get a vaccine. Um, happy to go into uh, any and all of the above and apologies for rambling there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, um, Ray Ellen and all of our panelists. We're going to turn now to your questions, and um, we I see that there's a bunch of them there, and that also uh, uh, Professor Berkshire has been answering some of them, uh, which I'm hoping all of you can see, but um, we'll try and touch on a few of those too. But before we open it up to everybody, I just want to start out um, with a kind of prevention question for all three of you. Um, Dr. Clark, in particular, we're hearing about this tr tremendous prevention effort that you and your colleagues have embarked upon to debunk myths and misinformation. And um, and I wanna hear from Raylan on this too in terms of what the role of journalists, but what, what role do you see that journalists could have, um, you know, to, to, to help get out correct scientific information? We're supposed to be skeptical. We're not supposed to be the public health department, right? Uh, but, you know, should, should news outlets be running Q and A's? Should there be an ombuds person who's correcting our own sloppy errors? Or what, what, what do you all think might be some ways to, to move forward in this kind of crazy moment we're in? Well, you know, I, re I really think um, that, you know, Carl covered uh, a lot of, of some of the slippery points that, that may have happened in covering the pandemic. And I think, you know, working, and I think one of the two really key points that he said, one was making sure that when you're looking at preprints, which are not scientifically reviewed and say that actually upfront um, pre-publication or are not peer reviewed to check with people outside um, before you kind of run with it as fact. Um, and I think too, the other piece that could be done more is magnifying the efforts of organizations like Black Coalition Against COVID-19 to really show and counteract the, the narrative, for example, that, um, that, that, it's, that the 
African American community only pays attention to issues like Tuskegee because that's really not been the the experience and that sort of serves to reinforce that lack of agency that disempowerment that I mentioned so the more I think that it's shown that there are efforts that are underway that are success, successful to sort of debunk these myths and educate and really talk about some of the real nuanced factors around why some populations might be more reluctant than others, then you, you give people voice. And when you give people voice, then they're less likely to feel disempowered and more engaged in what actually happens to them and advocate for themselves. Thank you, Ray Ellen or, or Dr. Uh, Professor Bergstrom. Do either of you want to add anything to that? Uh, I I agree with with what you just said, um, Melissa, and um, it made me think about a specific uh, example um, when we uh, talk all the time about and you know this came up in the Native American Journalist Association had a great webinar about. Um, uh, mainstream malpractice, like the ways that mainstream journalists can do better at covering COVID-19 in Indian country. And it was kind of uh, along the same theme. It's that uh, glossing over historical um, issues uh, isn't good enough. You've got to really go, you've got to really dig, dig into it a bit more. With the, the, the example that I keep thinking about um, is uh, I spoke with a really interesting person named Jonathan Jackson at Mass General, um, and he said, you know, the, the real impact of Tuskegee was actually something called the Belmont Report, which set these standards for human research. And what it did was it was intended to prevent another Tuskegee. So it was intended to protect um, certain populations, certain populations deemed vulnerable from kind of being uh, mis taken advantage of in research. Uh, but the, the end result that's stuck with us for a very long time now is that it actually led to a lot of exclusion of certain populations from clinical trials and from research. And so, you know, decade, fast forward a few decades, and what we've got is this landscape in which many treatments, many drugs have been uh, based on uh, had been basically developed for majority populations. Well, that's a pretty important piece of context to, to think about. This isn't, the COVID vaccine hasn't been developed in a vacuum. It's coming out into this uh, landscape where uh, lots of drugs and treatment are, are not um, tested on a diverse population until the final phase of clinical trials. I'm gonna to turn to a question from um, one of our um, audience members who says, uh, what lessons from the successes in COVID communication to Black populations during this crisis should we be thinking about for different populations, such as white Republicans, where vaccine hesitancy is still high? Well, I think that the the differences between the populations are, are their reasons for deliberation are, the specifics are great. Some of it, too, does have to be dealt with in terms of that sense of disempowerment as well, though. Just like um, Ray Ellen said with the example of the, the person in the military, I don't know if they were black or white, but that sense of, you know, I haven't had choice in a whole lot of things. And so therefore, you know, I'm going to say no now. For those populations, you know, everyone in modern society has some sense of feeling disempowered. So addressing that issue, I think, is important. And sort of to hark back to the other question, one of the examples I was going to say is amplifying the message. One of the things we've done at Black Coalition Against COVID is amplify two messages. One is that an uh, enslaved African was the one who introduced the concept of inoculation into uh, American society in the smallpox epidemic of the 1700s. And number two is Dr. Kazmikia Corbett at NIH led the Moderna vaccine development. Just those two facts, actually, I have talked to a number of audiences and when I mention those, they go, wow, I didn't know that. I'm gonna take a second look at this because I feel represented. You know, again, taking that sense of disempowerment away. So to the extent that you could talk to white Republicans and help them feel 
less disempowered for whatever reasons they might feel disempowered in their present life, I think that's a huge lesson to take away. Um, we have a question from Dr. Chrisanna Mink. Uh, Dr. Clark and others, do you think the change from Trump to Biden and Harris was a factor in the decrease in hesitancy uh, for African-Americans in the January poll? Yes, I believe so. If you remember during the debates, um, then candidate uh, for Vice President Harris mentioned, uh, I think in one of her remarks that, you know, if the Trump administration told her to take the vaccine, she probably wouldn't. And I think that did reflect a number of people's um, sentiments for the reasons that I talked about um, in my opening remarks. And that when the administrations changed, I think there was somewhat of a sigh of relief on the part of, of, of many African-Americans that, okay, um, at least there, there's someone who's at the table who I feel represents what my concerns are. We, and, and there's actually a whole uh, cadre of people around vaccine distribution and health equity who are at the table in the Biden administration specific positions that have been created. And they've been very vocal in terms of getting out and talking about vaccine distribution and trying to reassure the public in general about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines. We have a question from Scott David who says, how do compulsory rules for immunization fit into the mix like motorcycle helmet rules, uh, which can be the basis for withholding federal aid to states or, or prerequisite to sending kids to school. Uh, the difference here is that helmet non-use is not equivalent to a nuisance that can affect other parties, unlike infectious disease. Well, I think one thing that uh, one has to consider is that a lot of the opposition to uh, whatever public health measures that have been involved in COVID have really been opposition to being told what to do by the government. And so, um, you know, when the government was, uh, when we were getting the messaging that, uh, that, you know, masks were early on, so a year ago, that masks were, were not necessary, um, you, had, uh, we, you had a set of people that were, uh, urgent, were, were highly pro-mask. As soon as the government flipped, um, it's fascinating that uh, the people who are now the strongest COVID denialists were all pro-mask until the government flipped. Now they're strongly anti-mask. Um, and it's really all about not being told what to do. And so it's natural to see those same voices um, because they weren't really about public health in the first place, uh, sliding into anti-vax uh, rhetoric at this point. And so I think one thing that you know, to, you've got to be aware of as you, uh, as you think about what to mandate and what not to is the, the pushback that uh, is, is inevitably going to follow um, as you put in those kinds of requirements. And um, anyone should feel free, of the three of you, to chime in here. We have a question from Stan uh, Yoshinobu, who says, how can scientists and journalists work together to address some of these big issues? That's a great question. Um, you know, we're working. I, I, think we need, I think we need more of that. I think that scientists need to um, spend more time uh, thinking about public communication um, and you know, of science. There's not, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, of course, a lot of different uh, uh, temperaments in the, in the scientific world. And so it's not going to be for everyone, but for people who do want to do that, uh, they should be, you know, encouraged to do that. There has traditionally been, you know, a little bit of a sense that, well, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're doing public outreach, then you're not really a very serious scientist. That's changing, thank goodness. I see the young generation uh, feeling very different about that. And so I think, you know, things like we're doing at the University of Washington, where we founded the Center for an Informed Public, um, that has, you know, exactly the mission that, uh, that, um, that Stan is talking about to bring together uh, scientists and, uh, and people working in the social sciences, people in public health with journalists, um, and look at you know, what are the sort of systemic approaches we can take to resolve the kinds of issues that I introduced at the start of my talk. That's not an answer, that's just a, a, a hint toward where we can start to look. Um, if people have specific answers, I'd love to hear them. And um, Adam Smith asks, can you point to any simple strategies or practical approaches that the average layperson who's not a scientist or doctor can use to distinguish between credible, trustworthy vaccine information and misinformation and propaganda? 
there's a very simple rule and I, I would like to pass to one of my other colleagues, but I want to just mention this very simple rule in, in the book that we wrote, which is if something seems too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. And that's a good place to start. Um, but I'd like to hear what, what uh, the others have to say. Yeah, so actually I, I wrote a book called, Excuse Me, Doctor, <laughs> I've Got What? Taking Ownership of Your Health and Making Healthcare Work for You. And there's a whole chapter on how to distinguish just general real information from, from fake information. But I think, you know, if you, you just have to consider the source. And if you can find another source from a reputable um, area that sort of um, backs it up, then it might be true. Um, and when I say reputable, I say um, health departments, uh, and university websites, uh, especially academic uh, medicine uh, universities, tend to be able to offer credible health information. So if you can cross-reference whatever you're seeing on social media with those sources and it's backed up, then I think you might be able to go with it. If you don't uh, and you see something opposite, then I think it should cause you to dig a little deeper. There's another thing that reporters know very, very well to do and uh, that we suggest everybody do, which is ask, who's telling me this? How do they know it? What are they trying to sell me? And if you ask those three questions, that can, uh, that can really get you a long way. And Ray Ellen, would you like to weigh in on this one? Uh, I think you, you both uh, captured a lot of it there. I think uh, I'll just echo like finding multiple reputable sources, very important one. I think uh, waiting is a pretty good one too. Like uh, news happens fast, uh, even reputable sources sometimes get it wrong. Like if you see something that's pretty crazy uh, or surprising, maybe just like hold off on sharing it um, until there's been enough time to, to read a little bit more, to understand if more elements of the story have, have come out. Um, I think just slowing down a bit could be really helpful uh, I, I, for everybody. I love that suggestion. I think we have a schema. Uh, well, it was it was worse a year ago, but we have this sort of crisis schema where we're thinking that we're in a crisis. We need the latest information. You know, the the world is going to change completely between when the first plane hits the tower and when the second plane hits the tower, or when the bombs start falling over Baghdad, or whatever it is. Uh, and so we 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 want the latest fastest information and we to do that we turn to social media and things like that and that makes us very vulnerable to misinformation whereas if we were to slow down and say look you know for a pandemic a pandemic unfolds in slow motion there's nothing that i need to know in the next 24 hours that's going to change anything i can wait i can read what uh you know professional health, health reporters like helen branswell say about this and then make up my mind and that's so critical to do so i really appreciate you bringing that up I just want to echo something that you said earlier, Professor Bertram, about introducing this idea of uncertainty, because sometimes reporters are under pressure, their competitors are all writing something and you have to write something, but that doesn't mean you have to produce the exact same story as everybody else. And you can have those qualifying paragraphs about what we know and what we don't know. And that can make your reporting much more trusted and valuable. We have a question. Well, from I'm sorry, let go ahead. Throw in, throw in one last thing. Yeah. What I mentioned about the Russian bots and trolls, one um, sort of nugget from the University of Maryland Center for Health Equity Research that, that uh, published a lot of that was just something real simple. There, in, in those that came directly from the Russian bots and trolls, there were a lot of sort of grammatical weird things that came because they were non-English speakers and, and misspelled words. So that's another thing to look at too. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Eddie Garcia who says, what strategies can journalists use when trying to undo disinformation damage without making an audience feel like they're being spoken down to and to not get people to dig their heels in deeper to their possibly false beliefs? I think presenting information factually and at least attempting to without an agenda, presenting the facts, um, and allowing people to make up their minds given the facts, sort of like how we used to do, <laughs> as opposed to a lot of opinion journalism, um, I think is sort of the way to sort of uh, allow people to get exposed to the information and sort of make up their own minds. That, that would be my suggestion. 
I think it's a really important question. And I, I think it's, um, I don't have any clear answers, unfortunately, but it's something I think about a lot. Um, one, one thing that I learned from uh, some folks who study vaccine misinformation specifically, um, but I, I think Dr. Clark has a different perspective on this, so it could be an interesting conversation, is that um, repeating a myth or repeating something that's wrong, even if you're right about to debunk it, is actually uh, can be really counterproductive. Um, cause it might be that the most memorable thing in the, the, you know, the context they were talking about was, uh, conversations that doctors might have with patients about the pros and cons of getting a vaccine. Um, the, 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 the nugget, the most memorable piece that the patient might take away, um, might not be the thing that followed up the myth. It might be the myth. And, um, there's, there's research that it can sort of propagate that way. Um, I don't know however, how to debunk a myth without laying out what the myth is. So uh, I think that that um, takes a little bit of, of journalistic uh, backflips. And I would love to hear what, uh, what Dr. Clark, how you approach this. So yeah, you're right. I do kind of see it very differently because as I mentioned before, all good disinformation, the stuff that really takes root and is hard to get on root from the ground has a kernel of truth in it. So unless you're able to contextualize that for people when you talk about it, you're not going to effectively uproot it. You might get, you know, when you go to pull up a weed, you might just get the top of the weed and the root is staying down there. So I really think that in order to really truly debunk things, you have to let people know that you know what they know and what they believe. Number two, parse the truth out from the, the false context and then put it into the proper context for them. And um, I don't think that that propagates the myth. I think it, again, it allows people to think or at least feel that they've been heard, just like the, we have something in medicine called the talk back method. So, you know, people speak back what, what, uh, what um, you've said so that you, you're, you're sure that each other's on the same page and then they feel heard and then you can go on and, debunk it. Part of the way that those, um, those, the Russian broads and trolls, you know, spread the misinformation is they put out the anti-vax information and then the pro-vaccine information was putting down the anti-vaxxers like, oh, those idiots, can you believe that they believe X, Y, Z? And so that's created this whole, you know, fear of, of on the, and I shouldn't say fear, but on the anti-vaxxers, part that they're going to feel to be made, you know, be made stupid or, or whatever. But if you engage with them, show them that you respect them and then address their concerns, I think that's a lot more effective than acting as if, you know, those things don't exist and they're not out there. And um, Ray Ellen, it's just a closing thing that I wanted to ask you if you wanted to speak to um, is what you were finding about also um, you know, anti-vaccine appropriation of, for example, the language of civil rights. I think that's interesting and in, in how you might navigate that as a reporter. Um, and, and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll close. Uh, yeah, a really important topic um, that predates the pandemic too. Uh, let's see. Um, so from, I can, I can speak a little about my own reporting here. Um, this was June last year. So uh, the, there were protests going on about um, police brutality, um, about the deaths of Floyd and Taylor. Uh, at the same time at the Colorado Capitol that there were those protests going on, there were um, people who uh, would identify as anti-vaxxers uh, protesting a, a bill that would uh, and did eventually pass it, added a, a layer to getting an exemption for your kids um, to opt out of the vaccine. So those things were going on at the same time. and. Um, what was striking is that a lot of the language used by people who were vehemently opposing this bill in, um, it, and were vehemently supporting what they call vaccine freedom and freedom of choice, um, they, were, they were using, they were conflating and almost co-opting what was going on outside um, with Black Lives Matter and with a lot of um, th this moment of reckoning. Um, they were kind of leveraging that to try to say like, uh, you know, any, any 
um, black leaders who aren't opposing this vaccine, like you're doing a disservice to your community. This is another way in which you can't trust establishments. And um, it turns out that was not a, a Colorado specific thing that a few um, months before you had in California, um, anti-vaxxers singing, we shall overcome at their Capitol building when, when vaccine legislation was, was going through the legislative pipeline there. Um, you had uh, um, prominent uh, anti-vax leaders like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, other reporters uh, described how, how he was trying to recruit thought leaders who were black um, to, uh, to the cause to, to spread misinformation about the dangers of vaccines. Um, and so all of that was going on long before any COVID vaccine existed, um, a year, half a year before that was the, the landscape that this was in. One conversation that really stood out to me and that I think about a lot from that time was talking to, you know, I wanted to ask a longtime civil rights activist in Denver, like, what do you think about them taking on this language? And, uh, and, and he thought it was ridiculous. He's like, this is, this is completely not okay. These are not the same issues. Uh, and, and we need uh, the black community in Denver to, to be getting vaccines because we can't afford infectious disease on top of all this other stuff that's going on. Um, but then when I asked him, okay, so when the COVID vaccine becomes available, are you gonna get it? He said, no way, I'm not gonna get it. I don't trust the establishment. So I just uh, don't, I don't have any clear conclusion, unfortunately, um, about these other than that, um, this has been an evolving landscape long before the COVID vaccine became available. Um, I think there were probably a lot of missed opportunities to have more um, discussions about uncertainty and vaccine development um, rather than waiting until um, they were actually on the market. And, um, and also that, uh, again, within, uh, within one person, you can, you can be very pro um, vaccines of a certain type and, and yet be um, uncertain about vaccines of, of another. Well, I, could, uh, oh, I was just going to be able to jump in. I think there's a, in, in, in the examples that you just gave, I think there's a conflation of the concepts of civil rights versus civil, civil, civil liberties. They're very different. Civil rights just means your equal opportunity to have access to what everybody else has access to versus civil liberties is the right to do what you want to do. And they're, they're different. And so I think you know, the, the vaccine groups that were co-opting civil rights were conflating the two when they really don't belong together because African-Americans have been um, oppressed in this country and their civil rights denied, which is very different than saying, oh, I want the freedom to not take the COVID vaccine or I want the freedom to ride my Harley without a motorcycle he helmet on. Those are very different things. And, um, you know, I spoke earlier about disempowerment but disempowerment in both communities, even though it might be perceived in one community that they're being disempowered, there's one community that actually has been disempowered historically. Well, I, I do wanna thank all three of you. You've given us so much to think about and I wanna thank our audience for their excellent questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't go through all of them, uh, but please know that this uh, webinar, the uh, video of it will be on centerforhealthjournalism.org a little later today, along with the PowerPoint presentations. And should you want to support our work with the Covering Coronavirus series, um, you can do so by uh, following the instructions right here, sending a text to 41444 and typing CHGJ for further instructions. And, um, and I want to wish you all well. Please take a moment to fill out our survey about this webinar and your ideas for future ones that would be most relevant to your work. And stay safe. Thank you.